Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, what we are doing is, uh, we are going down. Down, down, like way down. Down, on, down, under what, you tell me. But that's Australia. You know, uh, Australia has made a lot of wonderful, uh, contributions to the world. Right, uh, well, first and foremost, Kangaroo Jack. Nice. And then you're followed closely by Paul Hogan's leathery skin. But this story, crikey, and I don't use that term lightly, this like ranks on the opposite. I'm gonna keep my Australian accent impersonations to a minimum this time because it never goes well. It began in the early 90s and what was presumed was that you know koalas had finally developed a taste for man flesh was actually even worse. This guy, he's a fierce devil. So let's give this tail a goo. In late 1989, a man travelled to Australia. He was, he was very, very excited to visit. He'd always wanted to go and he was planning on backpacking his way across that great big country. At the time, he was 23 years old. His name was Paul Onions and he was from Birmingham, England. He was just out of the Royal Navy and was looking for a fresh start. He first stayed at a modest backpacker hostel in Sydney's King Cross area, the heart of Sydney and where a lot of backpackers first go, and he was partying and living the good life. Sipping Fosters, you know, eating Vegemite. Don't know what that is, it sounds disgusting. And just generally other Australian things. However, you know, his time flew by, right? And he was having a grand old time. His work visa was good to go. His wallet. Not so much. And so after, you know, going around town looking for some casual work and being unable to get it, he was recommended to do what pretty much all backpackers do in Australia, do seasonal work, fruit picking. A few friends told him the best place for that sort of thing was in the Riverina area. Basically a big old agricultural area southwest of Sydney. And so he was like, well, I've never picked fruit before. But you know what, I'll give it the good old college try. He was going to tum it and hope for the best. Now I know little, uh, being honest about Australia, but I do know it's pretty big and mostly filled with nothing. Australia is incalculably large. So it was brave of Paul and he didn't even know what was coming. He set out on the 25th of January 1990 and ended up on the side of a highway in Liverpool, outskirts of Sydney, and stuck the thumb out. It's hot, shockingly, in Australia in January, which is like the middle of summer in the Southern Hemisphere. So I'm sure that was some crack. So he popped into a little shop, was going to get a cold drink, and then he was just like randomly approached by this lad who came up and asked him if he needed a lift, asking where he was going south, same direction. And so they set off. This guy said his name was Bill, Big Bill, and he was full of questions for young Paul. Where are you from? Are you alone? Who knows you're here? When you do back, mate? They were yapping away, and Bill said he was from a Croatian immigrant family, divorced and from the local area. Their chumminess dwindled, though. About an hour into the trip, Bill started to become more agitated, aggressive, bitching and moaning about everything. Racist shite, sexist shite. And then he shut up completely. They eventually pulled over on the side of the highway. Bill said he needed something from the trunk. Paul, feeling like he did not want to be there with this Bill, he also got out, at which point Bill told him to get the fuck back in the car. Bill then produced a revolver and pointed his iron Paul. This bill then produced a rope. And, well, you can see where this is going. But Paul! He had some plums on him. He, he just um, somehow got out of the car and started racing through traffic on the highway, swerving and dodging cars. When he crossed the road, he turned and saw Bill smiling at him. Paul eventually flagged down a passing van, at which point, while stopped, Bill sprinted at him, lunged, and grappled Paul. They fought and Paul somehow managed to get into the van and they drove off, leaving this Bill behind. 
terrified, as you can imagine. He went to the police, but nothing, nothing happened. They didn't have enough to track who this Bill was. Paul would stay in Australia for a while longer before returning home to England, still scarred by what happened and what could have. It would be years later, years later before Paul would learn who Bill really was. And who he really was, you probably uh, guessed. That was Ivan Millet. Ivan Millet also thought he would give something the good old college try. Killing Paul Onions was his only survivor. On Saturday, the 19th of September, 1992, some folk on an orienteering course were out training in the BEA beautiful Belangelo State Forest. Let me tell you about Belangelo, baby. It's big, with lots of pine trees, and it's about an hour and a half south of Sydney. It's good for camping, maybe biking the trails, and other uh, things too, as Ivan found out. The rest of the population started learning that September Saturday, 1992. It was a lovely day, and the orienteers were deep in the woods when they began to smell something foul. Rotting meat. Maybe a kangaroo. Maybe even a wacky wallaby. Maybe a dingo. It wasn't. After they reported what they found, the police and detectives arrived that night, and the case of the backpacker murders began. The very next morning, a second body was found just a hundred feet from the first. The two bodies would later be identified as those of British backpackers, 21-year-old Caroline Clark and 22-year-old Joanne Walters. They were both last seen like where Paul had stayed in King's Cross on the 18th of April, 1992 five months before they were found. They, like Paul, had been traveling, looking for work. They had been reported missing in the British media, but they completely disappeared. Until now. It was very gruesome how they died. Joanne, she had been gagged and stabbed 14 times. Um, her spine had been severed, so she, she was paralyzed. She had no defensive wounds on her, and so it seemed like she might have been paralyzed before she was stabbed to death. Caroline had been shot. She had been shot 10 times in the head. She was also paralyzed. And from w the way she was laid out, it seemed like she had been used as target practice. How they died would lead the police to believe that the killer had um, taken his time. Due to the isolated area, the police thought whoever did this was, was likely a local. No out of Forrester probably would have gotten in this far. Jewelry remained. No real robbery. Bullet casings were found too. Cigarette butts also. The killer took his time. Though the decomposition was intense, there was no sign of a sexual motivation to the murders, though one of the victim's underwear was missing. They were just killed for the heck of it. Over the next week, multiple searches would be done in the forest, searching for clues, and maybe more bodies. None were found, nor really anything else. Months would go by, and the idea of it, of it being a serial killer, that would not enter anyone's head, and eventually, the detectives investigating would be reassigned to other cases. It was over a year later that the next bodies were found in that same Belangelo forest. In October 1993, a man was out, uh, he was collecting firewood as he regularly did. He was a local and he, he was pretty intensely, he was intensely interested in the murders being from the area. So he would go out and collect firewood, but he would start going into new areas to see if he could find anything. And then that October day, he drove to an area he hadn't been before and he saw bones. At first he thought it was a kangaroo. Kangaroo remains, maybe? He started investigating, 
And then he knew it wasn't a kangaroo when he found a human skull. This was when Belangelo became big news. Because two more, two more had been found. James Gibson and Deborah Everest, both 19 years old, both from Victoria, Australia. And they had last been seen in 1989. They had been hitchhiking and, well, vanished. What was odd about this case was that items belonging to James had been found years before, 80 miles to the north out of the forest. So his body being found here was odd. Those items, it was like his camera and a few other bits and bobs, they'd been placed on a guardrail of a road, way from where his body was. And they were laid out like somebody wanted them to be found. And so the police began to speculate that maybe, you know, somebody was trying to mislead the police. Due to the decomposition, two skeletons, it was very difficult to determine how they died. But there were cuts on the bones, so likely stabbed to death. Though bullet casings were found too from a Ruger repeating rifle. Both also had cuts on their spines. Probably had been paralyzed like the two other victims. There were slash marks on the skulls too. Like the killer had tried to carve something onto their heads. Now shit was getting pretty real. Uh, a task force was set up. Task Force Air. Tip line set up, locals questioned. And one local had seen something about a year prior. Something that was very disturbing uh, in the forest. First, he saw two separate vehicles driving, one a Ford sedan, and the second one was like a four-wheel drive. In the first car, a man was driving, and in the back seat were two other men, and then between the men was a woman, and she had like a cloth, cloth over her face. And then in, in, the, in the other car, a man was driving, there was a man in the back, and then another woman, like, cloth over her their face like they were being kidnapped. He gave this to the police and uh, you know couldn't remember the regs but could remember some numbers and off they went and he signed his name Alex Millet. The police continued their searches. And the following month, November 1993, another skeleton was found in the Belangelo Forest. That of Simone Schmidl, 21, from Germany. She had last been seen leaving Sydney for Melbourne in January 1991. Around her body lay beer bottles, a fire pit, bullet casings. She had been stabbed to death, her spine severed. Two days later, another two bodies were found. That's seven altogether. This time, it was two more Germans. Gabor Nugebauer, 21 years old, and Anya Habschied, 20 years old. Last seen leaving King's Cross in December 1991. Gabor had been shot in the head six times. Anya decapitated. Her skull never found. It appeared that she'd been alive when her head had been cut off and she was in the kneeling position. A profiler would say it looked ritualistic. There was evidence of torture to both victims, all three victims, and they would later scrap that determination that there was no sexual motivation. It seemed like all the victims, both men and women, had signs of sexual assault on them. And it was around this time that Paul Onions, back on the other side of the world, started hearing too about the bodies in Belanglo. He even called to report his attack again, but the police were so overloaded with tips it went unnoticed. Overloaded because 500,000 Australian dollars were offered for information leading to the arrest of the serial killer. 37 detectives, if you can believe it, were working on this case full time. And that's when they started following an earlier lead, right? Uh, the Malat one. The Alex Malat, what he had seen. The witness to, um, well, quite a disturbing sight, he said. That really drew the police in because they found not necessarily what he had seen suspicious. They found it a suspicious story to tell. They wanted to look at him. And he came from a very big family. So they decided to just take a look at the whole Millet family 
all together. They lived in the area. See, another uh, millet tip also came in, right? The girlfriend of a man who worked with Ivan Millet said, he, uh, yeah, yeah, check him out. Ivan worked at a concrete company. His brother Richard, too. Ivan also had a very dangerous criminal history. Ivan Robert Marco Millet was born on the 27th of December 1945, one of 14 children. His parents were Croatian immigrants, his dad worked the Sydney Ducks, his mother a homemaker. They were a big family, the parents, you know, were disciplinarians, and I suppose with that many kids, you kind of have to be. But the kids... They weren't having it. Petty crime, robberies, that sort of thing. Out of the ten boys in The Brood, seven were in trouble with the law. Crazy Ivan, he was, he was mad into it. He grew more and more familiar with the insides of jails. Continued robbing, stealing, joyriding, Grand Theft Auto, that, uh, that kind of shite and violence increasingly grew, too. He once bragged to a friend he knew how to turn a person into a head on a stick by stabbing them in the spine. He also loved shooting and hunting in the Belangolo. He was married for about five years, but she left due to horrific domestic violence. And it was not long after she left uh, that the murders began because he didn't have his wife to take out his rage on anymore. It was now Ivan against the world, and the world deserved it. Just because. He was also accused of kidnapping two hitchhikers and raping one of them in 1979, being armed with a knife and a rope. That was later, unfortunately, dismissed. On each of the approximate days the victims disappeared, Ivan was found to have not been in work, while the other millets were. He lived near the forest. He used to own a four-wheel drive, but sold it two months before the first bodies were found, and the police began surveilling Ivan Millet. The police also continually questioned Alex, and Alex, you know, Millet was becoming fearful that he was a suspect. He also mentioned at one point a backpack that Ivan had given to Alex's wife. When the police saw it, saw a picture of the backpack, well, that once belonged to Simone Schmidl. The police also tracked down the new owner of Ivan's old four-wheel drive. Under the seat, they found a bullet casing. It was a 22, and it matched casings found in the forest. The investigators also finally discovered Paul Onion's report and it matched what they had been concluding about Ivan Millet. Same area, same car, matching description, and M.O. Paul even flew back to speak with investigators and showed them where the attack had occurred. It occurred right outside the Belangolo. He then, during a video lineup, positively identified Ivan as his attacker. Ivan Millet's house was raided on the 22nd of May 1994 at 6.30 a.m. His girlfriend was in the house at the time, and so the house was surrounded, and the police politely, they rang him to inform him of this, that the house was surrounded, and they asked him to, to come out, hands up. After a bit of cajoling, he did, and he was arrested. Ivan Millet denied any a knowledge of uh, the murders. In his house, they also found a postcard addressed to Ivan, some way a friend had sent it from New Zealand. Though it wasn't addressed to Ivan Millet, it was addressed to Bill. A 50-year-old man is being questioned tonight in Sydney about the backpacker murders. He was arrested in a huge overnight operation in the Campbelltown area, and since then he's been charged with threatening a hitchhiker in 1990. The dawn raid was carried out by officers from Task Force Air set up last October after the remains of seven backpackers were discovered in the Belangolo State Forest. Today's arrest shocked residents from the street where the man lived at Eaglevale on Sydney's west. He's a really nice bloke. The man shared the house with his sister. His girlfriend was questioned by police. Locals said weeks of police activity suddenly made sense. Any time of the day, nearly you could go up there and there'd be a car parked and there'd be one or two men in there or whatever. 
It's understood the MacArthur area has been under surveillance for at least three months. Just six months ago, police weren't discounting the possibility of finding more bodies in the Belangolo Forest. The search area was widened, the reward doubled. 49-year-old man by the name of Ivan Milat appeared. He's a gang of bike occupation, comes from Eagle Vale. He's been charged with two counts, uh, one armed robbery and another of using a gun to commit an offence. Knives and weapons were found, items belonging to as many victims. He was charged with seven counts of murder and the attempted murder of Paul Onions. An angry Mr. Malat said it wasn't fair amidst cries from the gallery to give him bail. I'm stuck in jail, yet they don't have one iota of proof. Ivan Malat applied for bail, but that was immediately opposed by the Crown Prosecutor, who said back in 1971, Mr. Malat had fled the country for three years when he was facing rape charges. Mr. Malat said he'd been found not guilty and proclaimed his innocence, telling the court, I'm going to defend these charges. He was advised to plead guilty by his lawyer. And so he dismissed his lawyer after this. He went on trial in 1996, pleading not guilty to all the charges. The Millet family supported Ivan, said he didn't do it. What sort of uh, support is he getting from his family? Are many people uh, there to, to witness what's going on? Uh, his sister-in-law said they're proud of Ivan and they'll stick by him, despite the uh, anomaly of the charge. 145 witnesses took the stand. My God. Including Paul Onions. 15 weeks it lasted. Ivan himself went up denying everything and saying, someone's trying to make me look bad. Ivan received a life sentence for each murder, and six years for the attempted murder. And there you have it. Uh, there aren't enough crikeys in the world for this disturbing... It's Australia's worst serial killer. Goof troop over here. Truly scary shit. And many suspect he did not uh, act alone. In fact, I would say some are sure of it, judging by what he did. Like, most of his victims were in pairs, and so him being able to subdue them both at the same time, that perhaps, maybe, one of his brothers was involved, maybe more. And then, you know, when you, when you count what Alex said about seeing, you know, the cars and people in the cars and the kidnapping in the cars, you don't know what to believe. If that was true, well then there definitely was have been more people involved. Although if it was true, how did he not recognize his own brother? If he didn't see that, and it was false, then he was just incredibly stupid because he drew the police to his own family and his brother. And that wasn't the only murder in the Belanglo forest committed by a millet. Okay. Well, what I'm trying to do here is just to, to corroborate what happened earlier this morning and the questions that I had asked him this morning. Yeah. Uh, is it the case that you're not going to answer those questions about what happened? Yes. Now, I want to ask you some questions about that. Are you prepared to answer those questions? No. In 2012, Ivan's great-nephew, Matthew Millet, and a friend murdered a classmate. They were 19 years old. He was trying to follow in the footsteps of his serial killer uncle. Which is also kind of weird, because all of his family, or nearly all his family, say he's innocent. And he didn't do it. Matthew and his friend brought the victim, David, out to the Belanglo, where Matthew told him he was going to kill him and produced an axe. Matthew butchered the victim. The next day, you know, before he was caught, Matthew was bragging to people about what he had done. Said, well, hey, you know, I'm a Millet, <laughs> and that's just what we do, lads. It's another chapter in the criminal story of the Malat family. The great-nephew of serial killer Ivan Malat has been sentenced to at least 30 years in prison for murdering the teenager David Octoloni. He won't be getting out anytime soon. Only one of Ivan's family members ever publicly said Ivan is a real uh, piece of shit. His brother Boris. The rest kept their mouths quiet. Ivan, you'll be happy to hear, he didn't have a great time in jail. Uh, as soon as he arrived, he got the you know, seven shades of shite kicked out of him. He also tried to escape and failed miserably. All his appeals were worthless. In 2009, he cut off his own little finger trying to force an appeal, 
That was just wacky as uh, shit, not the actions of a sane individual, and the courts didn't uh, look too kindly upon it. He later went on a hunger strike for nine days, wasn't eating for nine days. This wasn't due to any kind of appeal. He was doing it to get a PlayStation. He didn't get it, and he's dead now. Toasty, I'm sure. Shortly before he died, he gave his police uh, a final interview. Well, he actually didn't give him jack shit. They, were, they had a final interview with him, and the reason why is because they are sh sure as shit that he is linked to a lot more disappearances and murders, unsolved cases, and they were trying to ask him, you're gonna die, please just help us put some cases to bed. This was his answer. Having a bit of a chat to see whether we can shed any light and maybe maybe um, get, um, get a bit of um, uh, closure or um, uh, for, for some families out there. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm here. Ivan. Ivan. Yeah, that's a breath. It's okay. I'm just tapping you because I don't know if you're asleep or awake. I don't want to keep banging you on the arm. Because uh, I don't believe anyone is so um, devoid of, of, um, of decency that they would take to the grave the knowledge and location of people's loved ones. The end result, Ivan, is that in three weeks or three months or however long you've got left on this, uh, on this um, earth, after you're gone, mate, and, and after, in years to come after we're all gone, uh, everyone left is still going to believe that you're responsible for those seven backpackers and probably for an abundance of others. I'd be certainly surprised if a, someone like yourself um, didn't want to put your two cents worth in, so to speak. If there's things that you would like to speak to us about, we'd be happy to listen. You feeling out of okay, Ivan? He's, I think he's been sleeping, Inspector Walpole. So we're just giving him a little shake. I was concerned yeah, he, he wasn't breathing. You're right. When we discovered that you weren't doing too well last week and we were thinking about it, I thought, well, you know, um, even, um, even I've been my lad. With everything that's been written about him, everything that's been said about him, uh, even Ivan Malat um, has a family. Even Ivan Malat um, has a daughter. You know, if you've got one religious bone in your body, Ivan, and, you, and there's talk in the paper, and I don't know how true it is that you reckon you're going to heaven, mate, you're going you're gonna to need something to get a foot in the door, champ. Ivan said nothing, and he never ever admitted what he had done. He took it all to the grave. See, Ivan, he was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, and it was terminal. He died in October 2019 at 74 years of age. Not many tears were shed. And so ends the story of Crazy Ivan. As I said, um, a lot of people believe he is responsible for many, many, many more murders than the seven he was convicted of and the one attempted one. Like... 30 possibly murders out there, but unfortunately we will never know. Though fortunately we will never know because he is pushing daisies. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this old video with yours truly. Go on. Here, I'll see you as always real soon in the next old video. Until then though, please go on. Here, take care of yourselves. Because I love you. Okay.